Tonight, an emergency program to rescue family members from Gaza criticized for having no urgency. And I'm stressed out. This is not an emergency program. Hundreds of applications submitted, zero approved visas. The families in dangerous limbo speak out. It would be irresponsible at this point in time uh, to put a number out there. Plus, how many billions of dollars will it cost to refurbish the nuclear plant in Pickering? Why the Ford government is willing to bet on nuclear, but unwilling to give an overall price tag. Wow, okay. And the unanimous vote that shocked the mayor pushing forward a new housing tax. Details on who'd be on the hook. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. We're starting tonight with people here in the GTA desperate to get their loved ones out of Gaza. A Milton man says he'll hold the Canadian government responsible if anything happens to his family as he waits for their temporary visa applications to process. The federal government opened the emergency program earlier this month, but those who have applied say it's been a slow disaster. Dale Manukduk has our top story tonight. We lost hope first. I was very positive. In December, the federal government announced Palestinians with extended family in Gaza could bring them to Canada and find safety from the war. Abdallah al-Hamadni quickly began gathering all the necessary documents. He even paid a lawyer $3,000 to make sure everything was in order. But things have not gone as planned. And I'm stressed out. This is not an emergency program. This is not an emergency program. If you call it emergency between two practice, you should be fast enough compared to the crisis in the ground. Al-Hamadni is trying to bring 60 family members from Gaza to Canada, the most important, his 72-year-old mother and his brother who has MS. He lost 15 kilograms of his weight and his blood pressure reached to 80, waiting and maybe he'll die in any moment. He submitted applications on January 9th within the first two hours of the window opening. The process is five steps, submitting a crisis web form, receiving a unique reference code, submitting an application to the federal government, finalizing admissibility, and then obtaining the temporary residency visa. But Al-Hamadni and many others stalled after step one. These two immigration lawyers who appeared on CBC's Metro Morning say the process is a disaster. As of today, they don't have a code. It's like the Hunger Games because I think the numbers from yesterday were like 960. So there's 40 spots left. Uh, they're still waiting for a code. They're feeling really hopeless and really devastated. The way that it has been you know, administered uh, or not has made it virtually impossible, at least for my clients, to, to apply. As of January 29th, 967 applications have been accepted into processing, meaning that applicants got a code and submitted an application through the government's portal. The ministry says movement out of Gaza remains extremely challenging and may not be possible as countries and other actors set their own entry and exit requirements. But that's not good enough for Al-Hamadni. He says every day counts, and if anything bad happens to his family, it's on Immigration Minister Mark Miller's hands. I have friends of mine. Their family members died waiting for this code. And I will sue him and his system that is not responsive, at least to give me the right to apply. No one from Gaza has come to Canada through the program yet. The ministry says applications are being reviewed to determine eligibility and admissibility. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Milton. Turning now to the inquest into the death of Sammy Yatim, the Toronto teen shot and killed by a police officer on a TTC streetcar more than a decade ago. Today, the jury heard closing submissions along with a lengthy list of potential recommendations for the system, and we could get the verdict as soon as tomorrow. Talia Ricci shows us what the jury is considering. Today, we heard from lawyers for Sammy Yatim's family, Toronto Police, along with a number of other parties. They addressed the inquest jurors and suggested 53 recommendations they may make in an effort to prevent deaths like this in the future. Asha James, the lawyer for Yatim's mother, Dr. Sahar Bahadi, focused on a few recommendations, highlighting the importance of mental health and financial supports for families who lose a loved one at the hands of Toronto Police. They're in this position, not a situation of their own making. Uh, and so I think it, it really is incumbent um, that the province ensure that these families have the supports that they need. They have been suffering endlessly for 10 years. 
James said Bahati also wants the force to ensure police training accurately reflects on the ground situations and to involve psychologists in early intervention programs. The inquest heard Yatim's sister still has days when she can't get out of bed because of the PTSD she lives with. Meanwhile, the Empowerment Council said it wants to see police take a trauma-informed approach to all people in crisis. Representatives for Toronto Police said Yatim's death shook the police world and said several improvements have been made to the force since his death. But they're also recommending improving de-escalation training, peer intervention systems and monitoring use of force incidents, as well as continuing to improve and support police mental health. In his closing submissions, former Constable James Frasillo's lawyer said three things could have changed the outcome of that night. Access to a taser, peer intervention training and better de-escalation training. Jurors have been told that the inquest should focus on police decision making and best practices in dealing with people in crisis and is not meant to re-examine the details of the shooting or Frasillo's actions that night. We just hope that the recommendations that come out of this are meaningful and impactful. We heard from everybody that Sammy's death changed policing and we need to ensure that those changes are monitored, updated and reflective of the best practices and new research and information coming forward so that we don't have to wait for the next death for it to change the face of policing. Jurors can review the proposal as they deliberate and compile their list of recommendations. The verdict and the final recommendations are expected in the coming days. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. The morning commute feels like ages ago by this point, but for many people using Line 2 this morning, it might have been a hard one to forget. Subway service was halted for two hours during the morning rush from Keel Station in the west all the way to St. George in the downtown. Greg Ross explains what happened and how the TTC responded. It was a longer than expected commute into work for many relying on Line 2 of the subway this morning. Here we are and we rerouted many times this morning so right now i don't have a clue where we're going <laughs> it's a little frustrating of course the ttc was forced to shut down service between keel and st george stations for a police investigation ttc spokesperson stuart green wants frustrated passengers to know they were dealing with a tragic situation the reality of this morning is that you know we had someone who unfortunately took their life and um, that requires a different kind of response. TTC staff were forced into scramble mode in order to deal with the thousands of unsuspecting riders. We were doing uh, station announcements. We had staff in the stations. We had on train announcements. Uh, so there were all these uh, different ways. We had social media posts, um, all of which was alerting our customers in real time. The shutdown created a massive backlog at St. George Station where lines one and two intersect, eventually forcing trains on line one to start bypassing it altogether. We noticed very early on, probably you know around 7 a.m., that it, it, that station, both the upper and lower levels of that station, were getting quite busy. It just made sense to bypass on line one so that we weren't putting more people into the station. According to the TTC, about 60 shuttle buses were diverted to the route to help alleviate the massive overflow of passengers, particularly at St. George Station. Many elected to find their own mode of transportation. Now I have to take an Uber, and like it's a higher like prices because everyone's Ubering as well, so it's just crazy. We understand the frustration of, of being delayed, but, you know, we would um, we would hope that people understand that, you know, when, when you know, a, a tragic situation occurs that uh, people might have, uh, you know, a bit more patience and empathy. Service was restored after a shutdown that lasted about two hours. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Toronto police are searching for suspects after a minivan crashed into an ambulance overnight. A big noise, let boom. And I wake up, I go outside. I see the police, I see everything, around 30 of them. The crash happening near Dover Court and DuPont at around 4 a.m. this morning. Police say a minivan struck an ambulance and a pole, and the driver ran away from the scene. The two paramedics were taken to hospital with non life threatening injuries, and anybody with information should contact police. Right now in the city, as we look live, it is two degrees and mostly cloudy. Victor Paolo has our first check of the forecast tonight. Victor, kind of a nice rest of the week on tap for us. Well, we're expecting that sun to come back when it comes towards the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for sure. But today was a great day. We got to get a little bit of that sun come through. Now, it will be a cloudy night followed up with a pretty cloudy Thursday, but we do have some sunny periods ahead. 
Now, your average high this time of year, minus 10.9 is your average high, and minus 2.3 is your average low. And when it comes to precipitation that we're going to be expecting over the next couple of days, well, not that much at all. But what we are going to be expecting, as you do see here, is going to be some cloud cover. And outside of the cloud cover, there'll be some periods where you get to see that sunshine come through. But speaking of sunshine, and tomorrow morning, when my little sunshine and your little ones are getting ready, well, it's going to be a cloudy start to their day, and it's going to be zero degrees, feeling like minus two, and it will be mainly cloudy. And a quick look at our three-day forecast, well, it's going to be a bit of sun coming through on Wednesday, but Thursday will be cloudy, and Friday will be a return to that sun again. Stay tuned to Chris and I for the rest of your three- and seven-day forecast. All right, Victor, thank you. East of the city to Pickering now, where the Ford government boasted about a multi-billion dollar refurbishment plan for Pickering's nuclear power plant. When it comes to keeping jobs and improving the environment, a lot of observers are applauding the plan. But there are tough questions tonight about how much it'll all cost. For the full story, let's turn to Queen's Park reporter Lorenda Redekop. Great to be here. The government made its announcement in front of dozens of workers and others in the industry who stand to benefit. This refurbishment, effectively a major overhaul of four of the generators, is going to have a huge impact. Once completely refurbished, the station will produce 2,000 megawatts of safe, reliable and clean electricity. The government says the generators date back to the 1980s. Refurbishing them will take 11 years and create about 11,000 jobs a year. The project is set to add more than 30 years to the lifespan of the oldest nuclear station in the country. The government says it'll cost $2 billion just for the initial phase of this refurbishment, but it wouldn't give any answers as to how much it could cost overall. It would be irresponsible at this point in time uh, to put a number out there because it's this essential design and scoping and engineering work uh, that is going to get us to the place where we can have a number that we can then look on, look at. However, the budget for a similar refurbishment at Darlington's nuclear station is $12.8 billion. A Toronto emergency room doctor is among the biggest supporters. This is great news. It's good news for the climate. 7.6 million transatlantic flights worth of CO2 avoided by keeping this plant in operation. We're still investing uh, in an outdated 1950s approach, which is high cost nuclear. But some critics say nuclear is too slow to build and too expensive. It just doesn't make any sense. If you want to meet the growing demand for electricity, you should focus on the lowest cost options and the options that can be brought online quickest, and that's wind and solar. The government disagrees. It paid hundreds of millions of dollars to cancel wind and solar projects when it was first elected and says nuclear is the most reliable, clean option. As for what people who live near the plant think? It's run its life cycle and it needs to uh, be shut down because uh, even the refurbishment I'm not overly comfortable with. We need it as an energy source. It already exists. They've already put billions of dollars into the plant. It employs a lot of people in the region. It's still not a done deal. It has to be approved by the federal regulator. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Pickering. All right, next to another big day at Toronto City Hall and another new housing tax passed a significant hurdle today. Olivia Chow's executive committee endorsing a new 10% land speculation tax for foreign home buyers. And despite today's unanimous support, as City Hall reporter Sean Jeffords tells us, not everyone thinks it'll be effective. Blink and you would have missed it. Municipal non-resident speculation tax on foreign buyers of residents Residential property, I am sure no one is holding it. Whoa. I'll move it. Wow. Okay. And with that, Mayor Olivia Chow's executive committee endorsed a plan to tax foreign home buyers in the city with no debate. City staff are recommending the 10% tax on sale price to address the housing crisis. They think it will help dissuade foreign buyers from profiting off the supply shortage. And the mayor says Toronto is just following in the footsteps of other governments by creating the tax. And the executive committee members today endorsed it without much debate because it's been talked about for quite a few years. Toronto's tax would go into effect January 1st, 2025. It could generate $15 million in revenue a year for the city. But the mayor concedes it's not a policy silver bullet. We have a housing crisis not because of uh, foreign buyers. There's a slight contribution to it. We have a problem on housing as a housing crisis because of supply. 
Experts say this tax may have a limited impact because it targets such a small number of sales, possibly as few as 3%. I, I understand that it's sort of low hanging fruit, I think, uh, um, for, for, for a lot of policymakers at the same time, what we really want to see um, at the municipal, at the provincial, and even federal level um, is that continued focus on, on housing supply. I think instead, perhaps we should be focusing, if we're talking about unaffordability for Canadians, focusing on um, local investors. Like who actually owns a majority of the properties in Canada and in Toronto? Um, who has more than three properties? Is it a foreign investor or is it a local investor? This new fee would be coupled with the province's existing 25% tax in foreign home buyers. And the federal government has temporarily banned foreign buyers in the Canadian market. But that could lift at the end of the year. Councillor Brad Bradford is skeptical about whether this will have any impact on Toronto's housing crisis. This sort of strikes uh, me as another opportunity to, to collect a few bucks. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to build more housing supply. We need to make it easier to deliver housing. Um, this is another layer of bureaucracy. Ultimately, City Council must still approve the tax. It will be debated at a meeting next week at City Hall. Sean Jeffords, CBC News, Toronto. Returning now with one of the most anticipated debates of the day that did not end up happening tonight, not yet anyway, a controversial motion banning certain flags at schools in the Catholic School Board north of Toronto was deferred at a board meeting tonight. It follows a move last year to ban the pride flag at the board's office, even though tonight's debate will now be punted to a future day. As Patrick Swadden shows us, it's already left some feeling fearful. A heartbreaking moment for many students last summer when trustees from the York Catholic District School Board voted against flying the Progress Pride flag outside its Catholic Education Centre. It doesn't align with her Catholic values and that's fundamentally why I voted against it. Trustee Frank Alexander was one of six voting against the motion. He's now tabling a new motion to further restrict which flags can fly at York Catholic schools. If passed, it would only allow the Canadian Ontario Municipal Papal or school flags to be flown on premises of the York Catholic District School Board and would eliminate the board's ability to approve flags from other organizations. There's the Every Child Matters flag as well, which has previously been flown at York Catholic schools. And this advocate says Catholic that flag would no longer be allowed. Some CBC Toronto reached out to Trustee Alexander, but did not receive a response. And others are saying flying different flags shows diversity. To talk about that and to talk about our different lived experience was uh, a strength of Canadians and a strength of this country and uh, something that could bring us together, not separate us. This student says symbols like the Progress Pride flag are empowering. All of those students that feel represented by those flags are losing that connection to their identity within school. And Olechny says the school board doesn't feel safe right now. What we're seeing is a repeat of last year. It's very frustrating because our existence, our identities, are being threatened. Olechny says he's hopeful the motion won't not pass, but not everyone shares school. his optimism, including this former York Catholic school student. But it's very undemocratic. You're taking away the ability of elected education trustees now or in the future to be able to determine what flags are flown. Cody's organization wants to end the public funding of Catholic education in Ontario. It makes me really frustrated that we are using our tax dollars to fund a school that does not have to uh, that does not stay to that doesn't have to follow the same standards as other public institutions. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Vaughan. Another couple days of warmth before the colder air returns and brings more of the sun along with it. Let's get back to Victa now with the long range forecast. Take a look at the map of North America here. Well, one thing you can note, you can see a lot of those temperatures, a lot of those cold temperatures have really worked its way up north. As you see up top here in Hallowood, it's minus 20, but over in Edmonton and Calgary, it wasn't too long ago where they were in minus 20s and minus 22s as well. Now, taking a look at what it's going to be looking like for the long range forecast. Well, one thing we can note here is you can see closer to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the temperatures will be getting a bit cooler. But before we get there, talking about tonight, it's going to be minus one, feeling like minus six. And a quick look at how much rain we're going to be expecting between now and let's say midday Thursday. Well, the good news is not that much rain at all. 
but here's what we will be expecting. And a bird's eye view of what's happening in our region, well, it's going to be mainly cloud cover. Not much precipitation really will be happening. Wednesday, you're going to see a bit of sun, sun come through, which is going to be really nice to see. But as you get closer towards Thursday, that's when the clouds start to get thick again. Taking a closer look here, you can see that your Wednesday will have some periods where the sun will come through, which is going to be much welcome. But as you do get later on to the day closer to Thursday, you can see that Thursday is going to be a day filled with just thick cloud cover and not a lot of periods where that sun's going to really come through. But as you get closer to the weekend, here's what we can look forward to. The return of this little one right here, and we're talking about the sun. Now taking a look at your Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, well, there still remains mild temperatures. But if you look at that overnight nose, overnight lows, when it comes to your Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you do see that they eventually get down to minus fives and minus fours, and even a minus three for Tuesday. But the good takeaway here is when it does come to your Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, well, look at all that sunshine that's gonna be working its way in. Hope you all have yourselves a lovely night and make sure when you're making plans for the weekend, you have some plans to get some of that sun because it's going to be out on Saturday and Sunday and we've missed it because it hasn't been out for a while. Have a great night and over to you, Chris. Yeah, I can't wait for all that sunshine. Thanks, Victor. Finally tonight, a Michelin-starred chef hosted a master class for students at George Brown College today. 40 years I dedicate to understand the culinary world. So I want to give my experience to the young generation. Don Alfonso 1890 is a two-star Michelin restaurant in Italy, and they also have a location here in Toronto's downtown. For the students attending the master class, it was a great opportunity to learn from one of the best. It's in a once in a blue moon opportunity that you gather a chance to be a part of this master class and uh, I really thank to George Brown College who has arranged such a beautiful master class for us. The cooking is not only about uh, making something delicious, it is also about gathering the knowledge about the ingredients and choosing the right ingredient you're putting on the plate. The event is in celebration of 20 years of partnership between Alma School of Culinary Arts in Italy and George Brown College. And that's it for us tonight. I'll be back with you tomorrow night at 11, and we'll see you then.